what I of course uh, think I should talk about is Bauhaus and uh, and these kind of thing about the new society that historical was around the Bauhaus school and how uh, man or you can say uh, the human being and its environment actually was perceived in a new way. Uh, it's quite important when we are talking about Bauhaus that we uh, that we know what we are talking about and. Um, First of all, I'm. Uh, we we of course have this scheme that everybody knows that it was three directors and it was moved three times uh, from Weimar to Dessau and then and the latest one to Berlin, and uh, and the least director has a significant influence on how uh, the teaching was at uh, the school and how how uh, uh, what, where the concentration was. Uh, so for me, when we are talking about Bauhaus, uh, of course, I, I, I'm, 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 uh, I'm lecturing about Bauhaus and uh, not so much about uh, this specific theme I'm doing today, but uh, Bauhaus generally. But when you're talking about Bauhaus, you might say that there is, after my opinion, uh, uh, a quite uh, contradiction in it. So when we, uh, if we have to define what Bauhaus is, you can might say that we Bauhaus started, as you can see on the right, that is the, we all know this kind of a front page of it, that is uh, from a, from a, a got, uh, you can, it's an expressive uh, way. Uh, and then already on this uh, thing from a celebration in 1923, you can see that it has become much more rationalized in how it wants to express itself. So it actually was a school, uh, a school that was in, de uh, in development and you can also see uh, how it actually uh, 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 was coming from a, uh, uh, some kind of a, out of a, some kind of a, a warfare uh, situation uh, where uh, 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 you would have a, 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 a this kind of a trench warfare, static trench warfare that would be there during World War uh, One, and uh, a quite uh, you can say uh, a depressive view on how mechanization actually had on uh, the, the result on human beings from certain point of view. So this was kind of uh, uh, how it looked. You can see that there's a reminiscences of uh, mechanized aspects from the modern world that is in some kind of a total destructive state here uh, uh, in the trenches from the First World War um, uh, that was just before Bauhaus actually started. And um, uh, during this, you would have a, you would have a, uh, 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 a much more um, uh, 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 positive aspect of uh, how uh, the human mankind actually should look like and how it was the ideal of society if you were the new man in society and how the environment actually was. And uh, here you have got uh, uh, the movie that has a, how can you say, among the intellectuals, a substantial influence on how uh, the ideal of the uh, human man was. It was a movie from uh, uh, 1924, made by uh, uh, Marcel Lerbier, that was called Dan Human, uh, where uh, a lot of the uh, uh, people that were in society, that was the most modern uh, architects and uh, and of course, artists, it was uh, incorporating Fernand Lichy, uh, architect was Malay Stevens, and uh, 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 you would have what at that time was the most uh, abstract and modern uh, uh, ballet theater in Paris, that was the Swedish ballet that you see there on top, and that was all integrated actually uh, into the architecture. And, um, and if you, if you uh, look at uh, how uh, the, uh, how you perceived the ideal of the modern human being, then uh, then I'm just showing you this very short uh, 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 
this very short uh, aspect of it, uh, where you can see actually the ideal of the dynamic engineer that actually was the ideal of how the human being should be at that time. Um, the, so uh, there's no sound on it because the sound here, I have tried it yesterday, it was really bad, but you would, you would see how architecture is integrally ideal of the uh, new architecture uh, compared with the old uh, Paris is actually perceived in it and how the dynamics of this engineer, that was the ideal of how, a, how, a, how a, 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 the new generation should actually be to kind of a, a conquer the new world. You will see here that he's jumping into the car, very dynamic, everything is in movement. He's like, like a cowboy on a horseback. And uh, uh, in this dynamic way, he's, he's, um, he's uh, driving uh, through the landscape. Uh, from that and, and dreaming of where he's gonna be in this kind of a society where there are a lot of different uh, nationalities gathered, as you see, it's an international event. And uh, this high speed this person is coming with, already fascinating that this is less than 100 years ago. This here would be very dramatic <laughs> looking at it. And um, this engineer, he, uh, He's a young engineer, and if I translate it, he's passionate about mechanical sports and the magic of modern science. So modern science had some kind of magic on it, and it is not sport he's interested in, normal sport, it's mechanical sport, combined with some kind of engineer uh, idea. You see the speed is quite deliric, also driving through the woods here, that's, that's something fascinating is hiding uh, behind it and he arrives at the, uh, starts to arrive at the place uh, 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 with this deliric uh, uh, superimposed pictures of his speed. And uh, he turns up in front of the, the place. And of course he jumps out of the uh, parks where you see the old Paris on the back screen here. And now he's going into the new world and he's not going, he's actually running because of course he's a dynamic person. Uh, and when you see his face here, it's actually not a very masculine or, or how can you say, uh, 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 masculine or powerful person, but it's, it's more like, a, uh, what you would say a new typology of a person that have both sexes uh, in him. And what I wanted to say by this, that it is this kind of a, of a of ideal that actually Bauhaus was founded in, where this kind of new technology and the space uh, was speed and also how uh, space were perceived was quite important. And on the other hand, if we didn't then continue after Bauhaus and after the Second World War, you have this famous picture from Dresden, where you once again see how the whole world is totally put into a chaotic situation uh, by uh, means of the mechanical world. So the, 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 the world is in a sort of a dilemma at that state. Uh, do we have it on, you can say on one side, you have the intellectual uh, world or the elite that actually have some kind of a, of a, of an, an ideal of, a, of the human uh, 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 body and the mechanical world that they are unifying. And at the same time, you have like the mechanical world and, um, and, uh, 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 the mechanical world and and uh, and the human the body is actually uh, a, a destructive part. Uh, I have a little problem on my. Okay, so uh, with this kind of uh, intro, where 
I actually was a little bit uh, distracted because suddenly somehow it slipped out that uh, uh, that uh, which I started because my picture here is not like a, a presenter screen, so I can see uh, what is. But but um, uh, how you perceive Bauhaus, if we get back to Bauhaus, is actually from my from my point of view that there are three stages. There's the first stage where you you can say that they have the expressive stage. You have uh, Johannes Eaton and others that are part of the school, then you, it's developed into what I would call some kind of romantic rationalism. Uh, uh, but in the middle, uh, during the uh, development and leadership of, uh, of uh, group use uh, in Dessau, and then uh, the later part of it is some kind of social participation when Hannes Meyer took over. So our, how we perceive uh, a Bauhaus, uh, as it is something uh, a homogeneous thing, is act is for me uh, quite difficult to uh, to have that statement. And also, on the other hand, you would say that there would be uh, what what is actually Bauhaus in uh, uh, defined as a school? It, it was a school, but did anything new actually develop in Bauhaus? And then I would say not very many new things happened. Bauhaus was like a school that actually gathered the different kind of extremely um, skilled and, uh, and high developed uh, uh, artists, architects and craftsmen in a school and, uh, and uh, they were kind of uh, gathered in a collective uh, uh, education situation where like you would I would say that if you have a Kandinsky then already uh, already uh, constructivism had uh, been there for quite a long time uh, uh, and uh, if you have those book for instance from uh, from uh, neo the neoplasticism uh, 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 direction in uh, in Holland then already that had been developed quite far when um, when they were connected to Bauhaus. So um, Bauhaus was more like a school that joined all of these kind of uh, highly uh, original and highly professional uh, artists, craftsmen and architects. So my uh, lecture here is into three, uh, three uh, stages, like a triade, uh, first body and space, uh, and then there would be object and space, and then there would be architecture and space to deal with actually the topic of today. So let's just uh, uh, get into uh, into it. Uh, first of all, it, it's um, quite uh, just to jump something completely different place. It is quite fascinating when I first discovered. Uh, not myself, but also started reading about it, uh, joining lectures and event that that uh, scientific management in uh, the New York in the States had a really uh, significant influence on uh, how space and how uh, art was uh, perceived and constructed in uh, in both uh, Europe and and uh, Russia or the Soviet Union. Uh, Let's just go back to have a little uh, uh, flashback to what actually this scientific management management was about. In uh, in eighteen eighty two, it uh, the mechanical engineer Taylor he he uh, started working at a factory and he was like a mechanical engineer and he was thinking about how could you in increase industrial productivity by a really investigation and a rational in investigation into how the productive flow would be at the uh, industrial plants. And he found out that he could actually uh, get a much more uh, 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 rational and uh, higher production if, he, if this kind of rational investigation and uh, and coordination was made. 
and at the same time, there, there seemed to be different person at that time. But but Taylor, of course, is known because this period is also known as Taylorism. Then uh, Frank B. Gilbert Brecht, he he developed what is time motion studies in in the, in the um, factory. So, so he would start to kind of um, uh, he would start to uh, investigate how long time you could uh, it would take to produce one element and how you could kind of change the whole production away and how you could speed up. And by starting how uh, every single uh, moment in a production by uh, by the uh, time, he could kind of then start to rationalize it and minimize time. And in that, in in this case, uh, increased production. You would at the same time have uh, this kind of Fordism. And uh, and uh, Ford said he was never inspired by Taylor. It was actually all developed uh, at his production line. He started this production line, and uh, you would have this kind of a uh, Charles E. Sorensen that actually was in charge of the whole factories. You might know him because he later also was in charge of the whole American uh, war production during the Second World War. He was born in Copenhagen, but uh, was an engineer, uh, grown up in the States. And uh, and he, of course, also connected the famous architect Albert Kahn. They were invited to uh, to uh, you, uh, to Soviet Union. It was quite uh, amazing, actually. But Lenin uh, was thinking already in uh, 1918 that he needed some kind of a... a, a uh, how can you say, to speed up uh, production in uh, the factories in Soviet Union. Uh, when in 1914, he was really against the bourgeois, as he called him. He was like a bourgeois. Uh, 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 Taylor was a bourgeois uh, uh, thinker that actually uh, only wanted to kind of uh, gain money for the capitalists. But he found out that he actually could use these kind of uh, methods and he invited, uh, among others, Sorens, and he also invited Albert Kahn, as you might know, a lot of Albert Kahn's uh, uh, factories are in the USSR. Uh, so they were kind of implementing uh, Taylorism into uh, the, uh, the Soviet Union's production line and how actually the movements and how rationalization should be. It then led to what is Quite astonishing, actually. We always think that that uh, that the capital and production and these kind of things they are inspired by by uh, architects and and artists and so on. But in this case, it's completely different. That uh, Taylor and the theories of Taylor inspired a really dominant character in the Russian theater that was called uh, 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 Meyerhold. He had a, a theater that was called the Studio that opened in, uh, in 1914. And uh, through the inspiration of Taylorism, also through some kind of abstract uh, way of uh, 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 looking at how the body should move in space, he started to do physical training that was partly based on this kind of Taylorism. He said he wanted to achieve the highest expression with least effort and time. And by being inspired by Taylor's uh, way of studying uh, movement and also by studying time and motion, he developed what he called biomechanics, what should be some kind of a, a, a combination of uh, the biological uh, body with the mechanical movements. And uh, this is actually the start of what is uh, now called as kind of a theater training or, or, or body training for theater practice. Today, we might uh, not see it as some kind of extraordinary when we have uh, with our background. But at that time, you have, to, uh, you have to think that it was some kind of a portable or you would have the Swan Lake or something like that. That would be, um, that would be the standard of uh, ballet or body movement that would kind of be how the bourgeois uh, would uh, look at it but um, would look at uh, at uh, what they would look at when they went to a, 
a theater, but this uh, way of looking at the body and the body movements was uh, quite new and started to develop some kind of an abstract way of uh, moving the body. If I should go back to just to take uh, 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 the Taylorism, and then of course we can look at this uh, movie from the 30s, uh, 31, where they, uh, uh, it, it was wanted that women should kind of get into the production. So that is why the state, some kind of state propaganda made this kind of movies at that time. I have chosen this movie because it's there are quite a lot of movies where that actually shows there's a benefit of working in factories and how kind of mechanics can do for factories. But this is for me quite funny. This woman is working with a, a silk uh, a hose and uh, she of course can do that much better if she cut and this would cut down her fatigue and speed up production. So she's kind of uh, uh, using her leg, turning around and being in a very bad, <laughs> you can say, situation where she has to do all of the same movement all the time. That would, of course, um, from what we know today, totally uh, smash her, her, her back. And this is this kind of a movement, actually, that Taylor isn't propagandized in production lines. But when we come to to uh, Meyerhold, then these kind of a uh, theater plays where there were a new way of how the body and how actually space and objects should uh, react together. Meyerhold said, when you act, you should not do like um, the Stalin Stalinowski, you know the Stalinowski method that he that that you should. Before you actually get to the theater, you should live into the character of the theater. And then you should, when you are in the theater as an actor, you should actually be the character. So it means that you have to live into it. You have to be within. For Meyerhold, he said, you should be in the character, be outside of the character, and be in the space at the same time. So you should be part of totality, but also be uh, yourself at the same time. So when you do something that is accordance to other actors at the at the at the stage, and at that state time you could kind of get some kind of a total total theater. This is perhaps the most famous theater play, or one of the famous by and the settings were made by. The, the famous uh, scenographer Popolko, she designed this stage. So actually, when there was some kind of a feeling, so some uh, some kind of emotion uh, in the play, then all of the wheels could turn around. So it's called the mechanical stage setting. So if there was some kind of disruption or things like that, then the wheels could turn in different direction and be very abrupt. Abrupt in in. Uh, in the movement, or if it was some kind of harmonious, then they could all turn the same direction in a very slow speed. So everything would look harmonious to the actors. But if we're looking at biomechanics, then, uh, then I would just show you this very short uh, thing about, uh, about uh, shooting the bow. So you would get a good view of this abstraction in how to shoot a bow. This is a reconstruction because there are only very few uh, bad qualities left, but you see how the, the abstraction of shooting the bow and this physical uh, 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 thing that has to be developed to do it. That had to be at least one hour of training each day. And when I was younger, I was doing karate kata, and I guarantee you this here is really, really complicated for the body. But this is shooting the bow. So see the abstraction that is developed and how the, the different uh, spatial aspect of, of orthogonal, diagonal, uh, and uh, rotating shapes are incorporated in it. And you will see how, diff how he's, uh, all of the different um, aspects of how to shoot the bow is 
is uh, integrated in an extremely abstract spatial way uh, uh, with the body movement. You see the, the circles, the lines. And he's not totally sure yet before he's shooting the bow. So he has to kind of uh, concentrate more. So you see this kind of abstraction of how uh, the geometrical figures and uh, rationalization of how the body movement should be was something that was integrated into uh, how uh, Bauhaus was uh, thinking its spatial arrangement. Perhaps the most famous of all of, of this is the triadic ballet. It might be in the thread of what I was saying before that that uh, uh, not much of uh, the, uh, what was uh, developed in uh, in Bauhaus originated uh, from Bauhaus. Like the triadic ballet was already perceived in 1912, actually, and in its full form, it was of course performed in 1922. So it has like a long. Uh, period where it actually parts of it were uh, performed and uh, it was then developed into this quite a famous play where you can see that it is some kind of a, uh, you can say grotesque figure that the human body is integrated in uh, in uh, in uh, uh, in clear uh, Euclidean forms and you have this kind of a uh, movement that actually is coordinated according to a grid, rational grid system. So you would both be able to look at it where they are moving in rational terms, as you probably all know that they are, the two at the sides are all working in orthogonal uh, patterns, while the person here in the middle is doing an irrational movement or line on the surface. So this kind of a, working with the rational uh, forms and the rationalism is part of a, of it is is quite a, a, a leading back you can say to Meyerhold's way of uh, using form and just to show how the the grotesqueness you can say like like the Etruscan grotesqueness or the, is is here uh, in in how the, its shape and this relation you see in the, in the, in Oscar Slemmer, that there is not just you would have the body, but the body relates to the space, and you can start to rationalize how in which direction the body should move, and how uh, different part of the body how uh, how they should like swing around in left hand side, and that was part of the also how you when you look at Johannes Eaton that was. Uh, 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 one of the first uh, 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 teachers, he of course had this kind of a fascinating teaching system where you should move your body. So if you're doing anything, drawing or produ art production, first you should do body training. And after body training, and you had kind of uh, uh, being integrated in your space around you, you could start to kind of... Uh, 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 do your artwork and your studies. So, it you you might see this one uh, as some kind of integration of um, of space in a painting. Just to just to continue a little bit will how uh, body and space were perceived. I'm taking this part of it into it, but it is, uh, we of course had this kind of, uh, there's this kind of a 
quite important uh, uh, aspect that were in Bauhaus that nearly all of the teachers were taking photographs, this new media and media. And it, it was like this kind of a style that was named uh, Neues Sehen or New Vision Photography was part of Bauhaus and being a really important part of the Bauhaus uh, uh, movement. You can, you can see that Neue Seen is, of course, having some kind of dynamic and also show elements of the mechanical uh, universe that were you know, the mechanical uh, surroundings that were created at, uh, uh, during the mechanical industrial period. But I also see it as some kind of a, it, it refers somehow back to, uh, to, to Baroque, where you, where you had in the Baroque, you had con got the periscopes and you got uh, uh, where you could look at many of things that your body could not actually uh, perceive. You could not see it, but only with having an apparatus in between you and your body, you get a new angle on how the universe uh, were were uh, put together and then you could also look out to the stars and you could get stars you could see stars you could not see with your normal eyes and this noise scene is also a way where actually you would crawl around on different construction paths and you would look up and down and you would get new angles new way of looking that you normally wouldn't look at things and uh, German Kohl, that was not part of, a, of a, the Bauhaus. You might say that she could have been, but she was really an individual character. And you might also say that she was part of the new society. So it was not just art and, uh, and um, uh, uh, craft and productive aspects that were part of Bauhaus, but also there would be some kind of the liberated person that uh, 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 would uh, uh, a new liberation for German cruel. She was kind of the symbol of the liberated woman that had only that was. She was married to Joris Evans. That was kind of the famous uh, Dutch uh, uh, film photographer. But it was like an open relationship, and she was moving around to all kind of art parts in in Europe. Finally, she moved to India, and she died in. Uh, in uh, in uh, Nepal as a as a monk uh, in the eighties, but um, she was kind of a part of this movement that was really big on Bauhaus. You would also see uh, Marianne Brandt have kind of fantastic photographs of this kind of new way of perceiving uh, uh, the the space around you with your body. So I just jump into object and space. So uh, if you already look at object and space, it's a little bit like I said before that we would things in, in the idea about the object should be able to mass produce and it should be part of a democratic society where every person could get a, a well designed and a good product for, for little money. That was kind of the ideal already started with Peter Behrens. So it was not a new idea. And you might also say that Peter Behrens was very much like some of the uh, main person for Bauhaus to start because he, he started the, uh, the German Werk, uh, Werkbund, as I already mentioned, and uh, uh, already in 1907, and it was uh, Bauhaus was kind of a continuation of this kind of a Deutsche Werkbund uh, that had this ideal of the cooperation between artists, arts and craft, and uh, the industry. Uh, So here, here you will see some kind of some uh, part of what was produced in Bauhaus. That was uh, the the Bauhaus lamps that was um, in in made for mass production. As you see, they are like 
you already saw in the triad uh, uh, ballet, they were uh, getting back to more like Euclidean shapes, uh, uh, very simple shapes, uh, well, well pro uh, uh, proportioned and uh, uh, getting rid of uh, what would be all of the classical or bourgeois uh, uh, elements that you would see in um, in uh, um, most of the uh, 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 the other lamps. Uh, sorry. So so uh, yeah, there might be a little bit of a, a problem here when I'm when I'm changing uh, slides that it doesn't jump. Well, anyway, it's um it's uh, uh, you would see like like that was what was in the in at the same time in a contemporary situation you would have lamps like that in a uh, that would be in Warsaw you would buy it they were also mass produced but they referred back to some kind of a classical tradition and if you're just going a little bit back to Peter Behrens he already had done that in the IG corporate design where if you would see like a like a like a, uh, a like a uh, like a, a fan it would be decorated but Behrens started to do a fan where the, the aesthetic of the mechanics was the was the the point not actually how to decorate the mechanics into something else and if you have Mariana Brandt here that was a quite important per, uh, person at at Bauhaus her way of uh, of starting to uh, to you can say like uh, fragmentate and uh, and uh, make new uh, uh, compositions with Euclidean forms of uh, classical uh, 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 arts and craft uh, objects, and it might also show when you are getting to Bauhaus that it is uh, uh, that it is. Uh, the relation between function and actually form here is somehow out of touch if you get to it. I mean, if you have a cradle there, I'm always imagining how you are rolling the child there. And if the child is not already dead by getting down into this triangular form. So there's a certain kind of a formalism uh, and also sort of a um, of a conflict between the body and actually a form involved in it. it. The same could be said about how would the handle be there if you are having a full pot of tea and you are trying to lift it up, it might easily if slip out of your hands. And uh, the same, yeah, like the functionality is, is sort of not uh, in front. Of course, you would you would have the, the toys and uh, uh, also made out of the same Euclidean forms and uh, dolls, and uh, but uh, but uh, they, they were all kind of stabilized forms. And here, when you get to uh, more notch dynamic sculptures, then you see something that is actually completely different: the way of perceiving space as something that is um, that is fluctual, that is not uh, stable. As something that is in in constant movement, as something that is not uh, having anything to do with a, a Euclidean forms that in its basic also have a reference back to the classical way of looking at architecture, but it has a much more dynamic and moving and uh, and uh, changing uh, forms all the time and a class uh, more like a class of forms and views and uh, and materials and when you look for it you don't know if you're looking at a surface if you look at the plexi involved in it or you have this kind of a penetrating views into something that is behind it so you this kind of a views of some fluxes uh, in, in this kind of dynamic space there so just to say again that Bauhaus is not just one style. It has this kind of a, it's kind of built up on the, the, the dominant character that was there at the space that already brought uh, a certain kind of, uh, 
you, you could call it style or way of perceiving space into, uh, into Bauhaus. So I'm starting to kind of uh, finish now. So uh, uh, if we just finish very, very quickly, you would say that when you're looking to buildings, then already uh, the same thing is going on here. Bauhaus didn't start anything. Already you would have Tony Garnier, when you're talking about city, this kind of, we all know what development of uh, uh, like uh, segregation of functions from the old city industrial uh, hospitals and, and living areas uh, like you see here, mate. And uh, we have a Le Corbusier then in 25 of his way of uh, plan for Wasong in Paris how it can redirect to sun. We have uh, even Leonidov's way of uh, these uh, linear cities from 30s, how you integrate into the landscape. That is quite, um, for me, quite interesting uh, for, uh, uh, plan here. And, uh, and uh, Le Corbusier, that will be very shortly. Uh, you all know, of course, uh, and then I will take you uh, I would take you through the, the most important part here. From the Batisseur, where he's talking about how, how you develop a city. And you, of course, see here that he's, he's drawing everything that the man is in some kind of a mechanical drawing. It's part of kind of a strategy that is not from the man, but from a totality. Okay, it was just to, to show how everything is like a rational scheme, like a mechanical scheme. It, it, this could even be a plan for, a, for an industrial plant, how everything was organized. And, and uh, just to get back to it again, you would say that Bauhaus was, there's not kind of a Bauhaus style of, a, of, a, of how architecture is. We see it, but... But already in uh, in uh, Walter Grubius and Adolf Meyer already were developing a kind of modernistic uh, uh, approach to uh, to building so this kind of fantastic factors factory from 1911 this asymmetrical and local symmetry in, in a in a dualistic uh, play and uh, you would have like Bauhaus was then like this kind of dynamic situation. Well, uh, you have a road going through the, the building. Uh, so it has a full dynamic uh, aspect in asymmetrical uh, compositions uh, that would uh, look like a rationalized factory nearly. Yeah, I'm, I'm just jumping. So uh, all of these proposals, as you see, it, it, uh, it, it for future city, Ludwig Himmelsheimer, it's, um, it's a kind of a, a, a view, but already the view of the, the, the idea what already developed other places. And, uh, and uh, because I have to stop now, I need to kind of uh, uh, jump very fast uh, further on. So this was, you could say, kind of the end of a, of a Bauhaus. It was a, in Ludwig Hildesheim in 1927. At that period, we also have it kind of correspond very well to some kind of neue Sache kind. If you look at the list plan here, you see absolutely no nature. 
So nature is is a way it's like looking out of my window today. <laughs> no, it's a joke, but anyway, and you would see uh, Fritz Lang's movie that, of course, uh, you, you we are fascinated about that one at the same time in 1920, but it's, if you look at it, it's extremely critical about how this kind of class society is developing. And I think that is something that you could also take into your account that how technology is actually now <laughs> making even the class society even much bigger. And uh, and uh, you have some kind of a extremely billionaires and 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 even art has turned into some kind of a, a digital plate uh, with billionaires and and uh, money uh, speculation. Well, that's another thing. But uh, but already you would say that that in late twenties, uh, early thirties. You had this kind of skepticism that actually came from within the art movement, not from architects. Architects would be very late on that because they are earning money. And, and we have very difficulties of being critical because then we are shooting ourselves. But the, the, the cinema could actually more reach out to what people were thinking. And the, the first one that was really critical were sort of any Claire that already had been part of the, of the um, uh, of the modern movement uh, by this movie, Anula Liberté from 1931, that had a great impact on people. And uh, do you really have freedom? And uh, it's, of course, it's fantastic architecture, I think, uh, from uh, Mir Song. But, uh, but also show, is this really what you, what you are talking about is the glorious new world you're getting into where your body is putting into the frames of uh, the mechanical uh, uh, production line and like the mechanical production actually is uh, is ruling your way of, uh, of uh, making your life and uh, modern times in 36 and uh, uh, Charlie Chaplin was very inspired by uh, by René Claire, there was actually a conflict and a trial afterwards. But um, but that was, of course, how uh, and and uh, Charlie Chaplin was also extremely unpopular among uh, you could even uh, among, uh, of course, in the production in in the whole America because of this kind of criticizing what America was founding on the production lines. And Bauhaus is shut down, students are raised in 1933. That's everything we know. Sorry for, uh, for my uh, being over time. Thank you very much. I, I think just to finish it, I'm, I have, a, there were some slides that were missing. So that is why I was in the beginning being a little bit, uh, <laughs> Uh, because I, how to press it here seems to be a little bit uh, different from uh, how you do it. And I don't have my presenter tools. It doesn't work with Zoom. So uh, so there were some kind of uh, points that I had to uh, come up with later. So it was a little bit uh, messy in that way. No, thank you very much. It was um, definitely very, very interesting. And you really... Um introduced uh, a very good um, observation on the time and the ideas that were um, popular and that was leading society back then and the, the whole this, uh, designer community. And I think that's what we really needed, this kind of input so that we can continue the discussion. And um, that's where I would actually already open up the space for the discussion. Um, it was supposed um, not to uh, do that, but um, unfortunately, she um, she can, uh, cannot stay today longer because there was another um, collision of meetings. And um, I would like to ask all our listeners um, to participate in this discussion and uh, let's see if there are questions. I already have a question I would like to um, state it, but before maybe there is already somebody with a question that they want to share very quickly. If not, I 
I would like to ask you, you know that the topic is um, of our training program now is from Bauhaus to the new European Bauhaus. And um, what is your opinion about this political um, ambition of the European Union to start a movement to initiate again a movement among designers that is actually coming and architects and engineers that's actually coming um, top down. Um, what, did, what do you think about it? How do you perceive it? Do you think it makes sense like that? Is it the right name to use to refer to the Bauhaus again? And what is the place of radicalism in this new movement? So, so sorry for like my <laughs> start of the, the lecture was a little. I, there was some some slides missing, and it's it's how I was doing. It's just the point here is that first of all, <laughs> I'm just a, a little bit of, first to say what is actually Bauhaus. Then, then when we're talking about a Bauhaus, we're, of course, I'm I really is inspired by Johannes Eaton, but I think nobody. I don't know, I don't think very many people are inspired, but they are thinking about some building by Gropius or something like that. And but it's it we don't actually know what we're talking about when we're talking about Bauhaus was a gathering of people that already had developed their styles with uh, outside of, of Bauhaus, like the constructivistic movements, if I'm if I'm turning back to that, were much more interesting in their uh, way of doing uh, uh, architecture in 1927 than you would see by uh, by uh, by uh, 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 Ludwig Hildesheimer, after my opinion, and uh, much more engaging. So actually, a lot of things in Europe actually started, and and where they started and were founded were outside of, of Bauhaus. So if you want to have a new Bauhaus, you should actually come with a lot of aspects where you have been uh, uh, groundbreaking uh, in your own field, and then you should get it into some kind of dynamic uh, board, you can say, and, and there something should happen. Bauhaus was not a place where things actually happened, with really. it. You might also know that we don't know very many objects from Bauhaus. Very few, this is also what I, very few objects are known. We always talk about the same objects. What I showed you, you have seen thousands of times. There, uh, I don't know, I, I was reading, I don't know if it's true, last time I was in Bauhaus, that there are only 550 objects existing from Bauhaus. It might not be true, but I mean, still there are very few objects uh, existing. And the production in Bauhaus, people are saying it was not very big. Uh, uh, compared with it. So we are always showing how the teachers, the production of teachers, like when we're showing architecture, you have hardly seen any students work of architecture because probably not very many, if you had five year round that you should be there five years, you would know not very many students would be in the, in the course for five years. They would be there three years, two years, and they would be shortly in the course and then they would jump out again. Let me take an example of, uh, for instance, the Japanese. You, you, we all, you also have what is called, what, what might be uh, be quite uh, uh, strange for you to know that we have a uh, we have a Japanese Bauhaus in uh, in Tokyo, <laughs> because a person that was called Iwao Yamawaki, he came to Bauhaus. He only stayed there half a year, and then he went again, out and developed something new. So Bauhaus was more like a a a place where you met people, you get connections, you had very few courses, and then you then you went out in the world again, and you had this kind of dominant teacher. He had, he, his teacher was, uh, he, he had, it was Walter Peterhans, that was in charge of photography at that time. And, um, and he was really connected to him, not as Bauhaus, as, a, as, a, as an institution as much. So um, uh, it might be, what I'm getting to, it might be if you if people are thinking that everything was really developing in Bauhaus and that was where everything, even the triadis billet, as I showed you, were not perceived. It was not created in Bauhaus. It was like finalized in Bauhaus as a complete thing. But already Schoenberg has created the 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 musical score before Bauhaus. That is quite astonishing uh, to hear about that. So. Uh, uh, 
So it's very if if you have the idea that you would let that it would come within Bauhaus and then it would spread out like that. Bauhaus was something that people that had already developed something were gathering, and then there were students coming, and then they get something out of that gathering. But to say that something new started there is uh, is is very dif difficult. So when we have a new Bauhaus, what would that be then? If, if my way of looking at it is, is correct, then it would be like I told you that you already are coming from some different and groundbreaking grounds and you're meeting there and you're sharing uh, information. So in that way, it might sound possible, but, to f but think that you're just saying this word and then something new would, would suddenly come up, out from that. I think it's, um, it's, uh, it's, it's, very, uh, I don't think it's it's it it will happen. So uh, so this is the how people normally perceive Bauhaus as this is a unique and everything started in Bauhaus. For me, a lot of things stopped in Bauhaus because uh, uh, you would say that uh, that if you're already looking at at constructivism, it started in 1910, 11. At that time, 12, you could see traces back to that. And then we are back in 31, 20 years after, when, when the Nazi and, and Stalin, when the Nazi period in Germany and when Stalin came in, uh, uh, came to, uh, when it came to uh, power, you know, Stalin, he, uh, he, he's, uh, Stalinism really started in 34, actually, when he killed one of his last friends and uh, and were totally alone and then the gulag and stalinism started at that time so um, in the early 30s it it stopped down but that was the end of that period and uh, and uh, bauhaus was sort of part of the end of closing down instead of starting up <laughs> that's that might be controversial for you to hear but it's but it's <laughs> When I'm looking at 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 avant-garde movement in Europe, I'm not looking at Bauhaus. I'm looking at movement that are before Bauhaus. That's the point here. Uh, that's that's uh, if you're looking at groundbreaking spatial aspects, then you're looking at laws or something like that from 1904. You could even look at. You would also look at early early 90s. You have a, 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 a Frank Lloyd Wright early building where there's really some kind of a groundbreaking spatial thinking, abstract thinking going on. And that is uh, basically 15 years before uh, Bauhaus even started. We're actually exactly at the, this transition period where we have all those new technologies where we need these groundbreaking ideas and approaches to space design the connection between body and space which are really like very much how you approach in your lecture so in a way we are looking exactly i see the european bauhaus as a, exactly as an invitation to everybody who would like to change the way we have worked with the built environment uh, and the way we are shaping it's uh, the future built environment that they come together and exactly um, exchange ideas, knowledge in order to continue creating this new shape, newly shaped built environment in, in a digital context. I think that is needed. I mean, we have a new school and we have got a little table where we can just sit like this and then we can have a, and there are no books allowed nearly. So books are not allowed anymore. And then you can sit and, uh, and, and write at your computer and then you have your, the neighbor is just sitting uh, uh, 30 centimeters from you. And then you have a neighbor on the uh, next side and the next side and the next side. So you have no space whatsoever to be, to think or to kind of work with your body and be around. I mean, if I'm doing something, I'm preparing a lecture and I'm walking around and going to the toilet or whatever, you cannot do that in these kind of shapes. So it's, uh, there's some kind of a, there's a lack of thinking, of, of rethinking how the body uh, should act according to this kind of extremely static aspect of being in front of a, of a computer screen all the time. 
and then that's the right opinion. That's, yeah. that's a big. I mean, otherwise, we should uh, develop a new spices where we kind of uh, just get bigger fingers or something, and then lose our body. We don't need legs anymore. <laughs> Our mind is flying. <laughs> yeah, our mind is flying, right? So, um, so that might also be when you're talking about the future out in space. That actually we have a lot of things that actually comes from uh, from uh, from the past that we cannot get rid of. That is also kind of the the kind of remarkable thing about uh, Le Corbusier that he had these kind of uh, visions, and uh, and I wanted to show you how he's talking about it, like it's some kind of a just a plan that the human being is just in it as a little as a little um, point but not actually having some kind of free will but after the second world war then he started to do something that is more getting into mysticism and when he did houses it was like cave dwellings well uh, like you're in a cave with you know uh, 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 plants on the on the roof and stuff like that so he changed completely after the Second World War. And also, it's a little bit frightening how architect can be so determined that uh, this is the correct thing. And the, he, he talked about um, the new mechanical universe. That is also what I, the word I use. That is uh, his words. And then after Second World War, he changed completely. I mean, how can an architect be truth, tr uh, trustworthy when you can change so overnight uh, with something that you have put into the mind of, a, of the whole society and the whole world, and then you can, then you change completely. That is a really scary after my opinion, that, uh, that uh, when architects starts to do, do ideology, that, and, and they, then they get a new idea and then the ideology can rapidly change into something completely different. But what, what, you are, what we're saying here is actually your body is still a reminiscence from the past that we have in it as well as our sexuality or however that is. Uh, I'm not, and, and whatever we are having that might not fit into uh, the present situation that we are in. So uh, sort of uh, the technology is developing rapidly away from our bodies. I think that was also what Meyerhold was trying to kind of try this unification of the body and and the new space that the machine should be and it should be in a much more poetic way than we actually uh, uh, than we are working so we don't get slaves but we actually use the mechanical movements as some kind of an inspiration as some kind of a future plan that was i think his ideal and uh, At the same time, you can say when I'm talking about this, and there's a big schism when we're talking about the intelligentsia that also the Bauhaus was. And at the time when you saw this kind of a new liberation from Bauhaus, new thing, then at the same time, there was kind of a population that was going in a completely different direction. So it, you can say it was a parallel society. We are talking about part of the society, but the, the majority of it were going towards that political stream that was going into Nazism. So that is also quite of a scary thing, I think. That there was no connection with actually what you would say that the elite was doing. Uh, what what uh, if we get to Nietzsche's word, übermenschlich, there was what uh, the übermensch was was thinking and what actually the population was thinking. This disconnection that happened at that time is, is a little bit frightening actually, like parallel societies uh, that are living within their own sphere. So uh, um, I don't know if that was, I cannot, of course, answer your question that way. I'm just thinking of it. It's uh, it has uh, the scaring aspect of of us. Of it. I do have com uh, comments on that, and I really enjoyed uh, listening to your opinion. But I don't want to take the floor from the other participants as well. So <laughs> I'll give the opportunity to someone else to to maybe to state their question or to bring in your aspect. 
otherwise I'll um, add up something <laughs> to what you just yeah. said. I would like to um, share some some thoughts, but maybe you partly or uh, uh, already answered uh, what I was thinking <laughs> or I'm going to question. Uh, you were you were mentioning uh, Fordism and um, and also um, just by by accident I I saw this Ch uh, Charlie Chaplin uh, movie uh, just a couple of days ago, um, and I, I had a, a very similar thought that kind of like when I look into um, the kind of within the new Bauhaus movement um, and political system that is prepared. Um, that this kind of like uh, rationalizing and um, modularizing of, of um, architecture and our spaces is kind of promoted a lot. Um, even I, I have some actually many colleagues who are uh, going into this direction. Um, and I think uh, kind of like when I personally rethink what new Bauhaus would mean, it, it is kind of referring more to kind of connecting what is there and what is kind of like using uh, the possibilities of today to kind of enhance the the quality of spaces and the living environment of of people, and this might not be ending up in a kind of rationalized um, pieces that put are put together into modules which are kind of additive or repetitive. And um, so, in that in that sense, um, I'm 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 a bit struggling as. Uh, at least some of, of the audience knows uh, with this kind of idea of new Bauhaus, what new Bauhaus means, because I totally agree that this should be the end point, not the starting point. My only comment here is that, that I also try to show that actually modernism that we are not talking about, we're always talking about is some positive aspect, had a criticism within it already from the early state. That there was some kind of a, uh, 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 there was some kind of mistake, and the human aspect was not actually seen into it. And I'm afraid we are doing the same mistake today in all our our building environment and uh, and our offices and aspects that are made. Very few of them are taking care of of actually the uh, irrational aspect of the human needs of the of uh, the human being of the body uh, i can many i just i can only talk about my surroundings that i have a i have a, a friends during this corona epidemic they had to stay at home and they have moved into new offices where they have to sit like uh, they are like a uh, really a uh, uh, chicken in in cages and uh, then they were asked do you want to work like this permanently or do you want to move back to the offices and and 87 percent of the employees said they wanted to work at home because the environment at the offices were so uh, annoying and they could not work within it or do proper work and at the same time i can also say that we are sitting together because now we can we can be together in new environments but we all have all people are having earphones on so I, I actually cannot, and they are sitting, I cannot talk with people. If I had my own office and there would be kind of a, you know, small spaces where you could start talking and get, commun we are not communicating with each other anymore because we are sitting too close. So we cannot talk together anymore and all have earphones on. So we can call to each other in the earphones perhaps. But even if we are close together, it's, it's a weird situation. But I think you are talking about the same because we have this kind of rational aspect of it. And uh, and I think it refers very well to Charlie Chaplin's way of, uh, of, of having criticism. And I, I think if you're talking about a new Bauhaus, then there should also be a criticism within this Bauhaus. <laughs> I mean, a negative aspect that should come forward. Yes, thank you. Uh, just one sm small comment you have shown uh, Charlie Chaplin sitting on this, uh, what is it, this kind of wheel like yeah. within the, uh, this is the moment when he kind of like goes into this machine of, um, actually I like even more when he's between these wheels where he kind of takes the shape of the wheels. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, that was, yeah, yes. Instead of riding them. Yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, 
Thanks, Gunther. If you don't have further command, I would then invite Pedro because he raised his hand. Hi, good morning. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really liked uh, the talk, Leaf. It's spot on, awesome stuff. And I just wanted to um, comment or ask, I mean, isn't it the proof that uh, that the fact that it's the, the highest political level of European Union to brand this and to use the Bauhaus in completely the opposite as the historical pathway as it was in the in the 20s and 30s, uh, a proof that this is somehow, um, how do you say, a complete um, uh, mismanagement, or how should, how should I say that? Or abuse, or some kind of a fake approach to, and 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 the people like us who are uh, trying to get hold to the resources that are being laid out to do something useful are going to spend most of our time, like we are doing now, talking about it, suspicious in in suspicious terms about what are we doing here, like what is this, is this about, instead of actually doing something that could be productive for the unity of Europe. Is that a question? I don't know. It's just the comment. A, I'm just thinking a lot. It's a comment, so but, complicated. but 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 I I think if you are having a project, then you are thinking about what is positive in Europe and and art and craft and and the ideal of industry is also was the ideal and so it's not just so so I think some politicians are showing okay we all think positive about Bauhaus. Nobody is thinking negative, right? <laughs> and and then you are just using it as a brand for making a project when you are thinking about digitalizing the world. I think that is how it is. So it's it's for me, it's it's most of the world is sort of fake <laughs> if you're talking about it. So you need some kind of label to put on your work, right? And then Bauhaus has been has been one of it. You can say a starting point, but I think things can develop out from that so instead of just thinking negative on what i'm doing here then you should just think well how can i think of the positive aspect also that was in bauhaus of kind of uh, of exchanging knowledge of exchanging ideas and starting to do projects right so I'm, i agree totally but i don't think that you should uh, turn down the project in that way i think you should just see that it's some kind of a generator for your ideas that's it. So I, I even think your next project, you could have a, and uh, you could have other speakers if you have another, uh, as, uh, other speakers that would not talk just about Bauhaus, but something completely different. That is, uh, could generate something for you, so it doesn't get so historical. But I, but I'm not skeptical about the project that you are doing in that way. And Bauhaus is used because it has a positive uh, aspect to it. I think. And come on, it's politicians who have, or something like that, that have made up an idea and among them, or you have to persuade politicians. So it should be easy digested. I have the feeling that Annette would like to say something here. <laughs> I, I have, yeah, I, um, first of all, thank you really very much for, for so many um, fantastic thoughts. And um, I, I'm, really thankful for this quite critical words and to 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 put the finger in the round or in the right spot and really say that um that it's a lot of branding at the same time i think it is so important to take opportunities and sharpen them so exactly what you just said on the one side we we um we need to be aware of of what was missing in in the Bauhaus, and uh, I really enjoyed the, all the, the the insight you gave us about what was the, the cultural panorama, what was around at that time, yeah, um, how explosive society was at that time, and to to take that and to formulate with that knowledge. Um, our own ideas and really it's it's so important not to forget human being um, because quite in, in, in quite on, a, on many levels 
in the moment we um, we do so. We start to yeah. That what what Günther also said. We we start to try to rationalize everything on all kind of fields. And now you are talking about the home office. We um, the in a way the company is uh, experience that it is much cheaper to have less space to rent for their for their people um, when they are in, in home office. So this this is a discussion with, which is coming now after Corona, and we need to be aware of that, and we need to. Um, uh, yeah, to to dig into this discussion with not abundance the the ideas of the Bauhaus, but uh, really to take the good ones and uh, to to make new developments on on the ones who needed to be developed. Yeah, so that was more a comment than a than a real question. <laughs> I agree. I totally agree. And I think Bauhaus is fantastic. I'm not against Bauhaus. I'm just trying to be a little bit critical approach. I'm really, I'm really fascinated about all of the ideas that came into Bauhaus and, and things like that. It's just uh, how we're perceiving Bauhaus. And, and just to have a little comment on what you're saying now, today, the radio is if you make an office, because of this kind of, they have seen now that people can work at home. So it's not made that you have both the opportunity to work at home or at the office. The radio, if there's like 100 employees at an office, then you only make office spaces for 80. Mm -hmm. exactly. This is the radio. This is the official radio in Denmark nowadays. Mm -hmm. So it means that you are in a situation where you actually got employed at a place and you don't have an office space mm -hmm. in it because of, uh, of, uh, of digitalization. Of, uh, of society and uh, is that very uh, do you really feel that you're part of something when you're sitting at home all the time now i'm so old i like more to sit at home than being in, at the school but uh, but i mean it's it's part of it it's a rationalized aspect of, of it you 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 think about all of the things you could get out of it but what actually ends up is that you only get the rush the rationalized and the bad thing out of it and the, your human body and your needs are are forgotten after my opinion Emilia. i can i can only agree with you on that and i think why are we having all these technologies and artificial intelligence um doing our work or helping us being more precise and work with more data mm -hmm. at the end of the day we spend even more time working and analyzing this data and trying to create something new and there is really no understanding that we actually need more space for uh, thinking in a free way, more space to regenerate uh, so that we can actually realize what has happened because the speed is just so much higher than actually what our bodies are used to. And this is another component that we really need to somehow integrate in the way we are thinking life and work in the future. But I wanted to refer actually much more to what you were saying about the office spaces, but our homes are not always actually don't always have the right lay layout so that we can work, have a nice uh, work environment at home. Maybe some of us are lucky to have this extra space where we can have this, um, this extra room where you can arrange your office equipment and everything else and you can get your privacy so that nobody else from the family or the other people you're living with actually disturbs. But this is not the case for, I would say, half of the society maybe. So a lot of people are actually struggling being at home and being distracted all the time by everything that's happening there. And we need, in this sense, not only think new working spaces, but also think new living spaces mm. and change the paradigm of how, what is actually, what, how much space do we actually need? Mm. That's what I want to comment on. Yeah, that, there's a, there's, I think you're right. And there's a whole new paradigm also like, uh, I think it was, there was, was it some years ago? Then it actually changed in Danish uh, cities that that more than uh, half of the population in the cities are living alone, actually, and uh, and how you're making apartment. But what is happening today is that you're just making small apartments <laughs> instead of that you're making flexible apartments. Mm -hmm. If you if you understand, you're just having this kind of little shelf that you can sit, and then next shelf, next shelf, next shelf. Instead of also you are living alone, but you have like having been in a marriage before, and then you have shared children, and they have been in a marriage before, and there are also children and stuff like that. How is this flexible living? And you have your workspace at home, and you have you are 
visited by your former uh, from the, your children in situation that you are alone in other situation. I don't know if you understand why, but that is the situation in Denmark. All of this flicks, suddenly you are a lot of person because you have your children and even their, their children from another marriage that has been there and stuff like that. So you have three children around you and you need that space and you're also working and suddenly you're totally alone. So this kind of flexibility that actually should be in our modern society, according to our modern living patterns, is not integrated in our in our cities today. Uh, in in my studio, we are working with that as one of the aspects we are working with about how these kind of uh, flexible solutions. But that is a huge fight with actual with econ economics, I think. That's true. There's this economic factor that, in a way, it's very important and always needs to be integrated in these kind of discussions because yes. only that's how we really can change, I think, um, what is happening in practice. Um, oh, Ugesh, hi. There is a comment from Riga. Uh, well, uh, hi, everyone. It's a very interesting discussion. <clears throat> and of course, <clears throat> uh, this uh, COVID situation. Uh, impacts uh, much <clears throat> uh, discussions but uh, my um, comment or, or my reflections <clears throat> is concerning uh, uh, the forecast that we cannot uh, probably have uh, how uh, the situation will impact um, life of society or the new mankind in a uh, longer period so uh, my question is um, how do you think uh, if this uh, everything that is linked with COVID, so um, office at home or, or social distance, uh, not uh, gathering together, um, earphones and, and all this stuff, uh, do you think that it is um, a long lasting, a permanent phenomenon? Or still uh, we will have somehow to survive uh, all this and uh, uh, maybe some time return uh, to uh, that uh, pattern that we call normal life. So uh, there have been diseases uh, and pandemics uh, also in history, and they have been very disasting. Uh, however, still um, society has adapted, has forgot, and uh, has returned to real life. So <clears throat> maybe this is our um, short term um, some kind of reflection or uh, or um, a concern because um, uh, for quite a long period we have lived in a very predictable uh, society uh, we have known what will be uh, tomorrow and the day after tomorrow uh, what our investments are how they are working and so everything uh, has been uh, very uh, predictable and now uh, there is a challenge that um, uh, we don't have this um, predictability anymore. And uh, we are concerned what will be tomorrow. Will there be a new virus, Omicron or, or some other? How it will impact our uh, habits, traveling, uh, everyday life and so. And then we are um, <clears throat> uh, very concerned about this. Uh, but how long lasting uh, is it? Thanks. That's my reflection. Yeah, it, it's a, uh, of course, a reflective uh, comment. I, I would say uh, in it, and and uh, a very wise one. Uh, uh, perhaps not very many of you are that old, so you remember when we had AIDS in our. Unfortunately, I was young when AIDS was uh, running uh, in Europe, and that was quite a, a, a really a bad. Thing. Also, because you could actually see in the in the in in the picture when you were out in the city who had AIDS and who didn't have AIDS, and it was a very stigmatic thing for the person that you that people wanted to they were sick and at the same time people wanted to stay away from them. It was really really so sort of I, I'm. <laughs> I'm personally thinking of that the AIDS uh, epidemic was much worse, not much worse, was really bad because of this stigmatizing people. Now it's it's uh, it doesn't have this kind of stigmatizing aspect uh, so much. But after AIDS, 
people more or less forgot everything and we got you know the medic the medication to 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 deal with it but i think we are in we are in i would call a double crisis or the the, the biggest crisis is is of course what we all know our environment and in my mental aspects and uh, that is uh, perhaps number one and also the building industry is really is is more than 40 percent of of the environmental impact so um, that is one thing but uh, the other thing i think that has made a change is actually what we have been talking about that this is kind of this kind of a long distance aspects that we are doing now that people can work different places it there's a speed up it already happened before but there's a speed up in this kind of communication and it also means we get into a situation where we have half communications i mean i can hardly look at your body language i mean are you sitting with your fingers like this or what are you doing under let's say i mean part of all of this kind of thing is totally dropped out uh, and um and uh, uh uh so so uh so we are getting into this kind of communication and there's a speed up of it that is the only thing i can see now that it has been speeded up and also what we're talking about it that there's a that there's a big interest in how you can actually reduce <laughs> i mean office spaces other kind of spaces uh in in my school where we where we just moved into a new school half a year ago no four months ago there were not office spaces enough for all of the employees so they had to kind of be uh, nomades inside the building all the time so they are like in a nomadic situation it's a completely different mental mind you have to be in. do i belong to the place or don't i belong to the place so something new happens now about about our belonging feeling I think so. Also, when I'm a, I'm away, I, I stay quite a long time away from the school because also I'm I'm that old that I'm COVID would would jump into me immediately. But uh, but uh, sometimes I'm that much away that I I hardly feel I belong to my working space anymore. So in my age, I like that. But uh, but when I was younger, I wouldn't like that. Appreciate that very much, and it would have some kind of mental impact on me. I think. So I think I think it 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 will make some changes. Of course, we would get back to a new normal, but there has been this kind of a digital speed up and digital communication speed up during this COVID that would have happened anyway. I think, but but the speed up has come, and uh, perhaps that is one thing you really should deal with in your in your research about how spatial. How how the spatial arrangements are uh, have have become with the speed up. I'm talking about the, the belongingness. That is one thing I think is important. That's very good that you're also. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, very good that you're mentioning the sense of belonging because that moment I thought because I'm read the documents of the New European Bauhaus and they also um, it's very interesting because they are what they're proclaiming is that they want to bring back the sense of belonging to the built environment. Oh, yes. and so, it's interesting. I just wanted to make this parallel, but I would like to give the word to Mahamat who has raised hands because there is a question. Uh, I just want to add something, uh, just my opinion about the long lasting of the situation, being in the rooms and not being in the offices, something being, and, and being addicted or being uh, addicted to the virtual environment. I guess uh, this pandemic situation uh, just made the context ready for the Silicon Valley companies to have the profit about the virtual environment because there was a trending about um, have using the digital environment as a tool that can uh, visualize your imagination. And then there these trends uh, converts and shift into the way that uh, do not just build your digital environment, try to live inside this digital environment. The, something that Mark Zuckerberg already uh, shows about the metaverse. I guess uh, this is a huge, uh, huge uh, invention of, digital, of visual environment because he said that you can imagine a world that you want to live inside it and you can add your friends inside it. So what you need in the real space occupation is just a chair. 
So you just need to have a chair to sit on it. So you don't need any space. Your, your occupation of a space is just limited to the uh, chair. And then you live inside your mind. You're, you're just going to the virtual environment. You're free to fly, to walk, to, uh, to meet your friends in any shape of the body you want, in any shape of the body your friends want. You can eat anything you want because your mind will accept that you're eating something. Uh, it's something like uh, it's going to beyond the physical environment and living in your mind. And uh, I guess it's, not, uh, it's something cool in the first look, but it's really uh, kind of a um, disaster when, when it comes to the real because uh, people uh, will lose the uh, the sense of the blindness, I, I guess, because uh, the, they they they, uh, they they didn't really find the physical space any suitable to the thing that they, uh, in compared to the things they saw in the virtual environment, and so they would prefer to to live in this virtual environment because uh, everything is ready for them in there, but in the physical in the physical space, they need to try to reach them, but in there, they just think about them, and they have them, and uh, I guess this is, a, this, this, this is, uh, and, and, and this uh, just brings the idea of the, of the movie of the Matrix, something like this, that uh, the artificial intelligence becomes very strong and feed the human the things that they want to see, and just use their energy to survive. And something like this, this is very sci fictional uh, uh, prediction of it, but I guess um, this is a, but in a lower uh, level of this, just as a, uh, just, just, just as a bad in fact, uh, just impact that this virtual environment could have. I think this is a way that uh, the, the inventation, the high, the high tech inventation of the virtual environment usage. And uh, uh, right now can mimic your gesture and also the small gesture of your fingers and also the uh, the gesture of your and the mimic of your face and, and your avatar can actually be like you in virtual environment so nobody will not have any interest to see, see other people in physics if it's in person and uh, and I, I guess uh, maybe uh, and yeah this is just the, 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 the my idea about this um this um, this this new technological developments uh just i i guess they are trying to convert themselves from being a tools that we can use to communicate to being a world that's going to swallow us and they are being uh, yes something like this I, I, this is the way and uh, yeah that's and and i guess for architects <laughs> there would be no uh, space because no one wants to build the building because they will live inside it in their mind. So the only thing they need to have is a chair and the box that they can live inside. The mm. physical is just, uh, and this is not good. What you're talking about is of course not totally uh, science fiction. First of all, you are talking about like, like the, the digital world that once they are creating it is like uh, want to earn as much money as they want. And then the secondly, addiction is part of it they wanted uh, people to get addiction in our brain we have this kind of a aspect that we wanted to kind of a satisfy some centers in our brain and then we're living in this kind of a you can say artificial or avatar world and if you're if i'm just taking one i have uh, lived in japan quite a lot and i'm a lot in japan and you have a different kind of a, a people in japan that actually cannot even uh, uh, put their uh, their uh, love or their feelings to a human being anymore. They have different mm -hmm. objects that actually is part of their avatar world, you can say, where they are putting their feelings into the object instead of having some kind of uh, empathy for other people in it. It's kind of a scaring thing, but this is actually, it's not, it's a reality. It has been going on. Japan is extreme in that way, I would say. So there is, but I think it's, it's not going to be for all. This is some part of the world, I think. It won't, I mean, it was, it would be, from my point, it's kind of my, my minority that, that it will happen within this, but people, other people will free them from this kind of a world, I think. 
Thank you, Lars. Um, we have five more minutes left before we close the session. And I would then like to give the word to Hassan with the last question for today. Thank you so much. Actually, it's not, it's a comment uh, following my colleague, Mohammed. Uh, I tried by myself the digital world, even before the pandemic, I used a uh, digital environment to live in like InView or Second Life, both uh, are platforms to meet people and you can make avatar for you, same as the idea of metaverse. What happened is I've been isolated from our community and uh, when I was in Iraq actually, and uh, I, tr I, I found myself even in a cut from my family and trying to, to develop myself in my career. And I felt I'm completely in another world, not the real world. And uh, it happened that I came uh, to Switzerland and then I moved now to Innsbruck. What I found myself, I am like a new baby just got born and seeing the new reality away from the digital world. And I'm except I was, like exploring, uh, exploring the people and the environment and all of it. And I found myself, I had a lack in communication and the uh, real life. But during like one month, I could adapt quickly about that. And I was deeply in that. Uh, and actually I'm afraid because I tried it by myself, this idea, uh, I'm afraid from the future that the humanity will live in the digital world and it will be exactly the movie of Matrix. And we are living in our, we are just sitting, we don't have the body activity and uh, we are just living in the illusion world, digital world, and we will have the miscommunication and not only about communicating with people, but also about uh, the body activity which is important also for our minds uh, as well. So um, uh, my question is, uh, do you think that lack uh, in communication or uh, the lack, the, the, this is a transformation in, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the society and a new kind of man will affect, uh, I mean, it will, it will develop a new life and, uh, for the people I feel it would be dangerous and this transformation because, yeah, actually I tried it by myself. It was like, I've been addicted for years in the digital world and I'm living in screen of my computer. That affected also my mind actually, but now I'm reviving. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I wonder how the humanity would be and how, what kind of society will be in the future, let's say about, 100 next 100 years uh, what kind of people that we will have uh, yeah I, I always think about it and yeah how, how the future would be but still there is no answer and the way of developing a new ideas to uh, avoid this uh, as Mohammed said the next disaster which is going to happen thank you just a little comment to it. Thank you for your description. And uh, and uh, luckily, you were you then find the happiness in your child, and you were not disappointed because your avatar child was much better than your real child. That was lucky for you, so you could wake up. But uh, but this is you you are. I think in every in every um, new future si situation, mankind are gonna are gonna face. There will also there will always be negative and positive aspect of it, and I think if my final comment and and to you, then part of what your job is, of course, to find some kind of ways or positive aspects that actually can kind of uh, lead in some kind of direction or have some kind of uh, influence on on how the direction will be. Unfortunately. My skepticism is that capital might be very powerful during the during the uh, during the Bauhaus era, but the capitalistic and 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 how 
the situation is now where Microsoft, all of these kind of uh, uh, firms that have so big interest in controlling you, controlling everything, commercializing every aspect you are doing, you get all kind of commercialized in all kind of ways. Uh, this is such a powerful thing, so it's very difficult to break through uh, to get out of that bond you have more or less there. But I think just to finish off, I think you have you have been coming with extremely interesting thoughts, and I uh, think you have uh, quite a lot of things to do in this new digital world, which I'm not an expert in. Uh, and uh, I think you, I congratulate you with your future work, and and hope you are. <laughs> Thank you, so you, you, you are going to get to some kind of, I would not say results, but I would say that you would start some interesting new projects that would lead in a positive direction. That is my uh, hope for you, that you are not talking with results, but you're talking with how to start up uh, with new aspects. Thank you so much. Also, thank you for this answer live. Um, I just mentioned that we actually ran out of time and I guess I see you've raised your hand, but <laughs> it's unfortunately too late. I don't, um, would not like to keep life a little bit longer. Maybe you can uh, write your question to him per email if that's okay. For that, yeah, or, that's fine. or if you would like to answer now, but... Uh... I can, I can, but I think I'm, uh, we have gone through a lot of aspects exactly. now i think perhaps you could uh, you could you could be within your own group and talk about it because if we are getting into kind of a talking about digital aspects i mean i'm not totally the expert on that aspect and uh, and i think that's a whole new philosoph philosophical uh, sphere we are getting into that uh, there might be some kind of interesting uh, person that you could invite to talk about the the digital uh, aspect and space. I think that would be quite interesting for your group. That is uh, my, uh, my, my views here have been kind of looking back in time and trying to, uh, to look at that we're in this kind of positive Bauhaus. There were also criticism and uh, about how the human being can be unified with the machine. And thank you very uh, and, much. And that was my, my main goal here. And, and mm -hmm. I, there was no actual answer that it was succeeded. But I mean, there was some kind of a Maya Holt and other that had this kind of romantic idea. And for you, it might be a goal to find out how can digitalization actually unify with the body. And I think also what is extremely important will, uh, will how, uh, uh, how uh, uh, sustainability and and the world uh, is gonna progress. Yeah, I think that's my answer to it. So I I hope you would you would you would get people to who are have a huge insight into this aspect in your next uh, session. Thank you so much. I will leave now. Thank you, and Thank you can you find much. my email address on uh, my school's internet page. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for really a fantastic lecture and thank you everybody for participating in the discussion and Emilia for moderating the discussion. Thank you.